Facebook and you're not part of the Tiny Boat Nation, you're doing it wrong. Come get feedback from boat builders all across the nation and all across the world, from different skill sets, different build styles, everything. Come check us out, post your build, show it off. What's going on guys, I'm Mike from TP Nation. Today starts my actual series on how to rebuild slash restore slash convert a John boat or a bass boat from start to finish. Okay, we're going to start with like ground zero today, the platform, which is choosing the right boat for you. And this video is very important because anything up from this point on is either going to make your conversion miserable or well worth it. Obviously, I get asked a lot, what's better, a flat bottom or a V-hole? really depends on your way of life. Some places, flat bottoms are like a way of life. In like skinny water, in water with thick, dense vegetation, like flat bottoms are like the way to go. And I, I honestly think they make easier boats to convert as far as like bass boat qualities, what they can actually feasibly do. They're much easier to convert. Um... So if you're on fairly calm bodies of water with no real waves present, no real crazy storms that come out of nowhere and like want to destroy your boat, a flat bottom is fine. But if you're going to go in any moderate lake with any deal, I would like look for its equivalent in a, in a V-hole and you'll be like substantially happier. Their ability to cut waves at high speeds or just cut waves in general, um, not get beat up so much is much better per like capita per its size than a flat bottom like a true flat bottom with no mod v in the front gets beat up by waves significantly bad and that's something we definitely have to keep in consideration the waves are just going to smack it first one how big is the actual boat and how wide is the boat okay so if we're looking like if you have like a 10 foot john boat i really don't know how well that thing is going to do an actual conversion there's not a whole lot you're going to be able to get out of it secondly um how successful your build is for how your style of fishing is going to be really specific on how much displacement like your boat can actually give in the water so you're starting to see a lot of these yaks rise up i mean we saw a lot of the narrow yaks and then now we start seeing these like bigger and wider yaks i don't know if you're seeing the trend it's because they finally caught on or they they knew but are eventually just starting to implement it width makes the difference in stability for your boat okay length not so much but width 42 inches or wider that's a pretty stable boat 42 inches minimum for doing two people on a watercraft. So if you're if you're specifically trying to make a one-man monster, like for backwaters or for just waters with horsepower limits or, you know, length restrictions or even just like electric-only lakes, like a 12-32 or a 12-36 boat for yourself would be great. Try, trying to run two people on a boat like that would be miserable. One of you would eventually probably fall off. Or you guys would just be so frustrated with the pitching and the rolling, specifically the rolling, that you would just leave even a 1436 and i've even heard of like 1536 john boats i think those things would still be incredibly unstable despite the length okay. where the length is important is how much stuff you're trying to fit in how much gear do you actually have and how much usable room do you want between you and the co-angler um a 1448 john boat is going to be incredibly stable it's going to be like a great one-man monster and it'll accommodate two just fine but the length might not be there for you you might not like that deal um somebody's going to get backboated a lot and also gear. Are you like conservative? Are you like are you that fear the guy with a one rod fisherman? Or are you a tackle junkie with like tons of tackle and like 20 rods? Because that plays into effect with length. You're gonna want something that's 16 feet or or longer to accommodate that much tackle to actually make rod lockers and tackle storage bins big enough for you to have all that stuff in there. Secondly, you're gonna want to be looking at how stout, how thick is the hole, okay? With smaller conversions, they require less material, so you can kind of get away with like a thinner hole, like a 1 16th inch hull. But like for anything that's big, you're trying to make like a major conversion, like a sophisticated one, and there's gonna be a lot of material in there. Um, just remember the bigger the boat, the more material you gotta stick in. Once you're at a 16 foot John boat, or like even a 1448, a lot of decking space has to go in there. I mean, you're gonna, it depends on how much money you wanna throw on the decking material, because the light, light, light material, like Kusa board or, or bamboo, that stuff is, you gotta have deep pockets. That's like 400 bucks a sheet. How old is the boat? How old is it? Is the boat company still in existence? Okay? Because boat companies that are still in existence today that have went through all the times are there for a reason. Okay? You guys can say whatever you want about certain boat companies. You say whatever you want about Tracker. But they've been around for a reason. Okay? And uh, think about it. If it's an offhand brand that's not in business today, you have to think about that. You have to wonder why it's not in business. So I run across a lot of like boats that have a lot of crappy, just both like old fishing boats, old bass boats, John boats alike that have a lot of bootleg stuff going on with them. Um, this this 14 foot Valco that I just converted 
I was extremely upset with the transom. I had thought somebody secondhand made it that way from the original stock version, but when I went to like remove the transom support, those were all stock rivets in the original transom support. That means like the original like creators of that boat stuck in treated plywood, which rotted away the back of the transom and caused, you know, people a whole lot of problems. That's not okay. Think about that. Look for like look for Gregor. Like a Gregor all welded boat, those things are sick. I mean, look for a tracker topper, look for like, you know, the Lowy series. You know, some of the companies that actually make you know, like lower like lower end John boats, those are pretty cool. And the newer the better. So like you can get a newer John boat today, they're gonna be built probably substantially better than the older John boats. It's just something to think about. Like the newer, the better there is, less stress on the rivets, less maintenance problems. So getting a newer boat and finding an all welded boat would probably be the best bet. Just to avoid leaking and, and maintenance of the rivets over time. Because once you convert a floor over those, really, really hard to tighten the rivets. You're going to have to have to worry about secondhand sealing with resin and all kinds of other BS. Another reason to worry about hole thickness and hole strength is when your kit's in there and you're going against waves or whatever. And you're feeling that boat flex in the water. Like be wary of seams starting to break, the hole starting to crack, rivets starting to warp and bend. And then you're going to start getting leaks out of nowhere. If you're taking a boat that big with a heavy kit and that thin a hole on some rough waters. So really, really be cautious of what bodies of water you're fishing. Now, if you're going to try and run like boats with horsepower restrictions, like 10 horsepower restrictions or electric only, you know, lakes that we are only subjected to, you know, electric outboards, you're really going to want to be like cutting corners crazy. You're going to want to be looking for thinner holes. You're going to want to be putting the lightest kit you can possibly put into a boat. And you're really wanting that thing to fly because... Any weight, any weight reduced off the boat really matters. 20 pounds matters at the end. 30 pounds matters in the end. 10 pounds matters in the end. It's a big deal. I'm going to final check. So if you're going to go buy like a used boat off the owner, the owner just wants a gun. He's not going to tell you what he did to it, all the bootleg crap he did to it. So let's do this little final checklist. Look for the bootleg mods. Okay, Look for a bunch of holes all over the boat because a boat has a whole lot of holes in it. I mean, that's just not a good thing. You don't want that. Um, look for... Um, like weird stuff. Look for stuff that's rusting. If it's got a lot of bolts there or like beams or anything that's rusting, you get wanna you wanna just kinda steer clear of that. If you find like like a bootleg transom saving mod, like like poles freaking bolted from the transom to the bench seat, that's not good. That means something went wrong. It means the transom was flexing. So look for cracks in the actual transom support. And then look at what color the, the wood is. Look at the transom specifically. Look and see if it's eated up, look if it's painted. Look if it's like if it's like a darker colored wood, like a darkerish, dark brown wood. It's a good chance that it's treated wood, and that is real bad. You just don't want to bite it all. There's a good chance that when you pull that that deal off to uh, redo the transom or whatever, that it's just gonna you're gonna see a bunch of corrosion. You probably you probably make holes in the aluminum when you pull it off. Look for white puffy like patches in the aluminum because that's corrosion. That's gonna be due to oxid oxidization and pitting and electrolysis depending. Look for boats that have been used in the oceans like a lot because the ocean, maybe the salt water content is so high that it'll, it will eventually corrode aluminum over time. It'll eventually corrode aluminum over time and you really just wanna look for that, okay? Look for the hole thickness, look for any little hole in the aluminum that was drilled directly into the hole that you can actually gauge and see the actual size hole thickness. You definitely want to make sure it's thicker because it's not necessarily apparent how thick the hole is whenever like you're up to it. But you can kind of press against it, see how firm it is, see how flexible it is. That might give you a little idea if there are no holes in it and the boat's generally well taken care of. Um, look for cracks, look for missing rivets, look for like like grinded down rivets from a grinder. That's not good. Um, Look for boats that have integrated keels, integrated spines down the bottom. You want those actually directly made into the bottom of the hull. Look, you want to steer clear of boats that have independent keels, okay? Specifically because it's super hard to seal those rivets. Those are going to be riveted parts of the boat, and they're going to be super hard to seal because you can't really actually get stuff in there. Independent keels are bad. Also, like, integrated keels and spines make really good draining for these boats. And if you find the ones that had like have they just have independent kills, not a whole lot of good draining. They generally have like 
you know, like spots in the ribs where the water can drain through, but it's really generally poor draining on that part. It takes the boat forever to drain. I don't know. A sign of independent kills on a boat, that stuff is just not doing, it's just not done anymore because it's not as good. And so that's, you're looking at a really old boat if it has those things. Check for a bunch of flex seal sprayed all over the inside of the boat because that is probably like the biggest bootleg mod. That is going to cover up really, really bad things. It's going to cover up cracks that, like if you just see a bunch of that stuff everywhere, don't even, don't even touch, just walk away from the boat. Walk away from it. Because that means there's leaks there and that guy or a growl who didn't do any infinite research to understand that like stopping leaks you have to do from the outside of the hole because the water pressure just cakes that stuff in there that's not good because first of all you won't be able to see the damage and second of all it's not going to do anything and third of all flex seal sucks for sealing up boats i don't care who you are or what you think how good it is might be good for sealing up a roof not for a boat like it stinks if you see fiberglass coatings or coatings with glovid or steel flex or anything underneath the hole i mean that could still be okay but ask why they did that. Like, really try to shake down the owner for this stuff. Like, put pressure on them. Like, and if you can't, just buy a new boat. Buy one from, from Cabela's or Bass Pro Shops. They're pretty cheap. I mean, they don't come with a trailer. That might be the only trade-off. You have to go buy a cheap trailer from Harbor Freight or something. But for around, around 1200 bucks, you can have, like, a good platform, something that you're pretty happy with, and that you can walk away and, and build and be secure knowing that you did it. So... Be cautious when you're when you're choosing your boat. This is the big deal. This is the ground zero. This is the start of your platform. Whether or not you're going to be happy with it at the end or you're just going to be miserable. This is it, guys. So the next video is going to be how much it actually costs to convert these ones. That's also the most popular question I ever get. And I've been putting together a cost matrix for that, and I'll be reviewing that in my next video. Okay. Hey, YouTubers, if you like this video, check out my channel. I have tons more videos on DIY boat building concepts. Check us out in the Tiny Boat Nation on Facebook. Gain access to the largest and fastest growing community of DIY boat builders out there. And if you want access to exclusive videos never released to the YouTube public, find out how you can become a VIP on Patreon.com.